Hello. Originally from Moldova, she's the senior researcher for the lead of the Cognitive Genomics Research Group in the Adelaide Medical School in the Adelaide University and the founder and artistic director of Titrov Drama Incorporated. And she's our guest. Hello, Liliana Chibano. Hello, Malcolm. It's Hello, a hard Liliana. thing for me to say your name. <laughs> We've just been talking about, did I say it even close? It was perfect. Thank oh, you. Oh, perfect. Oh, <laughs> big score for me. Liliana, it's been very hard to get you on this program, but I've been delighted that you can make it to this episode because your life is so fascinating. It's just a busy life. <laughs> well, you know, often we just don't realise how interesting our lives can be to others because we're living them at the time. And you just move to the next thing. Let's take you back to Moldova when you were a little girl. All right. What performance did you start with? What skill did you learn first? I've been performing <clears throat> since uh, as early as I remember myself. <laughs> um, always been um, into performing arts. We did music. you dance first or did you sing first? Music, or was it music, anything? dance. Um, singing, reciting, anything really, everything. Any excuse to get up in front of people? Um, Were you aware of that then? To be honest, I never enjoyed performing in front of people that oh, much. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Was so, that because your parents sort of pushed you to do that? No, no, they didn't push me anywhere um, inappropriate, but, <laughs> um, but I you... more enjoyed creating the content. Right. Yeah, so... We get together with, with, them, with my friends and, you know, um, And boss them it. about. Yes. <laughs> Always the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Always the boss. I like that. But, but uh, you've taught classical dance. Uh, yes, I did. Yep. And singing. A little bit of singing when I was doing um, my music, mm -hmm. musical training. I play violin. Oh, you play violin as well? Yes, I do. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> You're also now a theatre director as well. Yes. But so this creative process of, I suppose, encouraging others to do it as well, giving them the skill, but you had to get the skill to yourself first. So where did that come Absolutely. from? Absolutely. It comes from, uh, obviously, Moldova, where I, uh, where I got my dancing and ballet skills in uh, Academia of Art, Performing Arts. Was Moldova there a Russian influence in those days in yes, the country? Yes, there was back in Soviet Union days right. and yes, we had a lot of Russian influence. So the discipline teacher, would have been fairly full on? Uh, yes, and my teacher was actually from St. Petersburg. Oh right, okay. Yeah, my classical teacher. So did they use the stick and tap you on the no, leaves no. and you didn't do all that? <laughs> no, my teachers well, they, were they actually did here in Australia, <laughs> believe it or not. Now it's completely outlawed. I've but heard the stories. Those that, things used to happen. That wasn't my experience. Oh, life. that's wonderful. I I, well, lucky. I think if you're, if you're a teacher and you're passionate about something, Absolutely. you just want to get your thoughts into somebody else's Absolutely. head. Absolutely. If you're passionate about something and you've got the skills, you definitely will get people around you willing to learn from you. That's all. So your life was pottering along in Moldova and just explain what you were doing before you left there to come to Australia. Oh, I was trying to find my path, I think, in life, obviously, like everybody else does. But my path, to be honest, it was more like a I wonder, I would say, okay. <laughs> not a clear path, to be honest, considering where I ended up. So, um, yeah, I was doing performing arts, um, music, dance, uh, singing, everything. Were you overseeing that or directing that or were you part of that I as well? I was learning, I was probing and I was trying everything. And um, when I finished the school, um, I've decided to quit my performing arts career <laughs> and I went into psychology university so there was a pedagogy university of Pedago pedagogy I'm not sure if I'm saying was that correct. before you came to Australia or? yes that was before yep. so I studied psychology um, for five years um, probably in attempt to try to identify who I am and what, right. what I want to do did, with my life did you see parallels between the understanding of what you probably did naturally to then understand it technically Absolutely, yeah. Mm. There was, a, yeah, quite a quite a lot of overlap concepts, but I, of course I was interested more in uh, psychology of creativity. But 
I finished, I've graduated actually, from psychology. No one's ever said that, but that's actually so interesting to me, mm. the psychology of creativity. Yes. Because in order to help people come to terms with what they want in life, sometimes they need somebody to be a catalyst to help them to move. And good teachers Absolutely. are the ones that do Passion. that. Passion and knowledgeable teachers, that's yes, exactly. the best catalyst. <laughs> so why did you choose Australia and where did you come first of all? Um, yes, before I jumped into this question, I'll just finish with psychology degree. Oh, okay, because I did sure. my psychology degree and yep. I realised that this is not exactly what I want to do in my life. And I went back into um, high degree in arts. So where I studied another four years and became a ballet master. Right. Yep. Okay, then, yes, you did and, then you came to Australia. And simultaneously I opened my own company and my little ballet school back in Moldova in Kishinev. Oh, right, right. And, and all this time, because um, well, it's been for ten, ten years um, since I married, because I, I got married when I was in my second grade of my psychology degree oh. and got my first child. <laughs> Uh, and uh, well, my now, second... See, that's the other interesting thing. So you're a mum, you're still yes. studying. Yes. You're still teaching and, um, and developing people. I feel very privileged that I was able to do so. Um, obviously, um, a lot of, you know, thank you to my to support from my husband, um, who always supported my wonders in my, in my oh, yes, life. But knowing, knowing you a little bit as I do, I can also see you would be absolutely organised with everything that you did. Oh, no, not really. Oh, I'm <laughs> I not wish too I sure was. About that. I wish From I was. what I hear, no, you're very organised. So no. um, all of these things happened and then something changed in your life and you thought, um, I need to move, did you? Uh, we started to think about moving basically very soon after we got married. Right. Um, and what about the influences, though, from Russia next door? Was that... That was part of the story. That was part of the story. But the main um, reason why we moved to Australia was my husband's dream, to be honest, uh, because um, he's he's biologist by degree and passion biologist, and he was always wanted uh, and interested in unique Australian flora and fauna. Right. So he's been dreaming about visiting Australia, moving to Australia since his childhood. So and. We just thought we might try. <laughs> might, try. <laughs> might try. We had two children back then. I've, I've finished my second degree and right. we decided why not? Why not? Why not take this? Uh, so weather-wise, is Moldova similar to here or is it colder than here? Uh, in terms of weather? Yeah, you're almost um, the same. We have very pronounced seasons. We have four seasons. So do we, yes. So, uh, Unless you live in Melbourne where you have 36 all in the one day. <laughs> <laughs> true, that's true. Uh, a little bit colder, a little bit colder at winter, so it's snowing, probably minus 10, minus 15. Oh, that's so a lot goes, colder than here, yeah. yes. And uh, quite hot summers. Right. Can, can go up to 35. So yeah. you, so your husband did what he needed to do, yeah. but you, did you go back to university when you got here as well? No, uh, we moved here as skilled migrants in 2004. And I've been working, I realized that my psychology degree is quite useless in new realm because, because of the language barriers, right. and because of the culture barriers. Did you speak English um, before no. you came? No, <laughs> well, no. I always studied as a ballet girl, always studied French. So of course. I never studied English before. Before I came to Australia, so it was a big, big challenge for me. I would imagine. So do, so do How did you learn husband. that? I never learned it. I just started to speak. You English. just listened. I just listened, and I had Glass. to. Glass and exactly. I've never right. learned. I've never went into any single formal lesson of English. Right. I just. Well, we we were talking to the young man who came over here just before the war, um, just a little while ago. And I know that you looked after him for a while. Yes. Um, and he said the same thing. He'd picked up just virtually by listening to people yes. and trying to understand, oh, that's that, oh, that's that, that's a yeah. glass, that's a table, that's a shoe, and so exactly. on. Exactly. So I'm not very educated in terms of English. <laughs> I think you speak really well. That's so. not a problem. 
But the real thing now is when did you get into this research area that you're now in? Yes. Uh, so when I arrived to Australia as a ballet master and, you know, having uh, this experience in my life and I wanted to continue my career, mm. to my um, disappointment, to be honest, I realised that in South Australia we don't have any professional ballet company or Correct. professional ballet theatre where I can uh, use my skills and knowledge. So I've started teaching in all the little schools, private schools. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up doing, uh, being a um, ballet coach for Gymnastics South Australia. Uh, I've been coaching for many, many years, ballet technique for gymnasts. I, start, I started from rhythmic gymnastics and then uh, converted to artistic gymnastics. So I've raised maybe a few generations of gymnasts in yeah, South well, Australia who represented Because these the things country. really take great dedication, both mental and physical. Was the mental side of this part of an achievement for you to get people to think how focused you have to be? Mm. <laughs> My lips are sealed, <laughs> she said. My lips are sealed. Uh, you know, that was an interesting experience to get into a um, different environment, very different environment compared to professional uh, oh, Because it's a young environment. environment without that background, um, it I think. Took me, it took me a while to adjust my teaching styles, my knowledge to new realm and understand what is required, what skills can be used, what skills that I have can be right. used in gymnastics or uh, in, um, um, in ballet, in ballet, in dance in general. Mm -hmm. So I've been teaching everywhere I could um, in many, many places. Um, because that's another learning experience, isn't it? How do you deliver the knowledge you have to people who haven't had that foundation to yes, start with? Yes, that, that was quite challenging yeah, for me. I understand. Um, I've been doing this for nine years and after nine years of doing that, um, I've decided that um, kind of I'm not uh, professionally really... Um, fulfilled? Fulfilled. I get that. Simply so, because I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. Yes. Tendu plier, tendu plier, yep. relevé. Oh. <laughs> yep. when, when does that end? But what we're coming back to talk about in a moment is this amazing area that you're now working in researching, yes. which I think is fascinating for us all. So please join us. It will amaze you. Liliana's our special guest and we've talked about her background in the arts but now your background or your foreground going forward is more in research. Yes. And it's research of what's going on inside of this. Yes. Is that a simple way to explain it? <laughs> it's can good you, enough. Can you explain, because I'm fascinated with this, but can you explain the area of your research because you're now a doctor Yes. As, explain that too, please, first of all. Um, so I'm working, I'll, I'll try to put it in um, digestible. Yes, please. Because <laughs> I've read lots about you and it's very hard to I understand, understand. My apologies. I understand. No, 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 it's, no. it's very difficult. It's actually, it's very um, challenging to for scientists to communicate their science to um, general audience. Of course. And for me, it's it's been very challenging. But, it's, but when you're but talking about the ballet training, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. How do you how do you communicate what physically and mentally you have to do That's to become thing. that amazing creature on a stage? That's exactly but right. This is something else. So, uh, to to be short, uh, I'm studying. I'm trying to understand. We are trying to understand in our research groups the biological underpinnings of cognitive functioning. So what, are, what is the genetic component? What exactly happening um, at a molecular pathway level when we, at, at cognitive functioning, when we think, when we perform, when we reason? And how it's, um, since I'm working, I'm passionate about um, cognitive uh, research in, in, in the psychiatric area. So right. we're interested in um, see whether Genomic, um, genomic and biological underpinnings of cognitive functioning differ across psychiatric condition. Because we right. all know that uh, cognitive functioning is impaired in any psychiatric condition like depression, 
uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but clinical representation of cognitive functioning and any doctor and anyone uh, who, who had experience with uh, these kind of patients, they know that cognitive functioning differs. Right. How exactly? Uh, is there biological predisposition? Is and there this is research that hasn't been really done or understood before? No, not really. So, so to put it simply, um, when you talk about the genomics, this is basically the things we've inherited from our parents and how they've developed within us, in our brain. Is that a sim very simple way it's to put it? It's a very it? simple way to put it. Um, heritability estimates, it's one of the uh, components of my research. What I'm more interested in is uh, to pinpoint specific genes, specific how we call it, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, so single molecules in our DNA right. that are correlated and associated with specific cognitive function in our brain. So this can be like how depression, for example, may yes. affect not just being depressed, but the organs in our body as well, perhaps? Uh, I'm not working with the rest of the body. I'm working more with the um, Cognitive, um, cognitive representation of the... Um, so this is how we think and then how we react to things? Uh, Not yes, quite? Yes, Am I in yes. the right direction? Yes, yes. Okay. It's more about mental capacities, thinking and how and reasoning. And once you've, if you ever can, really understand the human brain, because that's really what you're studying, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's Where does that really take you? Is this to make life easier for people who have these issues, like you were saying with bipolar or depression? Potentially. So or treatment, if, sorry, or treatment yes, as well? Yes, potentially for treatment development. If we know the underlying biology, we can think about potential, developing potential treatments to right. treat specific pathways, molecular pathways that are affected within the brain in specific... So um, we're not just talking patients. about old people, we're talking about, I guess, even to children of who have got issues. Of yep. course, of course. We're talking about, um, you know, and children and adulthood and geriatric patients. Is it too simple to say that um, the way we think is just electrical impulses? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you say can you say that in a way that can you say how it works in a way we can understand? Nobody knows exactly how it works in all the yes, details. I'm so pleased you said that. <laughs> <laughs> in all the details, but a lot of people around the world, around the clock working um, to understand this better. Um, it's not just um, electrical uh, okay. <laughs> pulses. No, sure. It's also chemical reaction. It's also environmental influence. It's also genetic components. And so these are the very, things very, that you're complex. researching. Yes. Yep. There are very, very complex mechanisms involved in that. And this can be from basically birth, probably conception onwards, as, as the fetus develops into Absolute. a person. Developmental, yeah. cognitive development, it's a huge, huge part of research. So uh, is your research showing that these things can be affected by diet, for example, or sleep? or? Uh, yes, certainly they can. And there is a lot of research suggesting that, that's, that this is the case, that specific dietary reg regimes, they can affect cognitive functioning. And we're actually um, thinking about um, delving into this area of research with one of my uh, potential PhD students and new collaboration that we're working with, establishing at the moment. So maybe we'll have more. But you're, you've been travelling the world, literally, in the last few months. Yes. Um, is this going to seminars or symposiums or whatever to try and incorporate the knowledge from all over the world? Yes, how, how scientific world works, so you're working in your lab and then you, 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 you'd like to publish, you want to publish your uh, findings in, mm -hmm. in journals, but you also want to uh, attend the conferences, international national and international conferences where we get together, researchers within the same area, we exchange uh, knowledge, we discuss, we're establishing collaborations. Uh, so uh, I just came back from um, um, from, such, from such a conference in Spain where we gathered together and discussed a lot of things and established new collaborations. So, yeah, this is... Where do you feel this is taking you? Um, with, with, first of all, a physical, with dance, a, a very physical thing, <laughs> a training the body and then the brain or the brain and the body, the brain to do the physical things, to where you're going now. Where do you feel you're going with it? 
See, it's a very, very tricky question that I, I ask this question myself uh, <laughs> quite often. <laughs> How to combine these two things together in me, it never been, um, I could never combine them together. So when I'm at work at the university, I'm a researcher, I'm a researcher. And then it takes a couple of hours to switch and <laughs> evenings, I'm, <laughs> I'm a director of the theatre. I need to well, get back to so, And a mum. Yes. So, but, you know, people in the theatre, they know that I'm a researcher, but they, they know me as a theatre person. Yes, yes. <laughs> At university, not many people know that I uh, run a theatre company. And I'm but but this has obviously dancer. helped you to have a better appreciation as to how people think. Maybe. <laughs> Well, when you think about it, like we were saying before, you know, uh, for example, ballet is such a physical discipline of the mind and body because it's not just the body. You've got to think how to make it happen yes. properly. Yes. And really so you're just music. working in a much wider extension of research with that. Yes. But hang on, we've got to take a short break and we'll be back in a tick. And welcome back. We're about to ask the most important question of our guest, Liliana. So all this research, all this knowledge that you're gaining from people all around the world at the same time, uh, is this research really that the sole purpose of it is to learn how to treat these issues that people may have emotionally, mentally, depression, bipolar, whatever it may be? Definitely. Do the chemicals that make up the drugs or whatever, do things exist now that are moving in the same direction that your research is going? This is what, this is very interesting question, Malcolm, because this is exactly what we're trying to figure out. If we know, we don't know at the moment, if we know, if we can pinpoint specific pathway, molecular pathway that are, affect, that are um, involved in specific condition like mm -hmm. cognitive functioning, specific cognitive function in specific disorder, so we can target this pathway. So then we can find, we can start searching for potential drug. Maybe it's already existing. So we right. can, this is called drug repurposing. Right. So we can we can see whether we can use this this um, drug to treat potentially this um, specific. Uh, condition. Conditions. Conditions. Because the reality is what you're trying to do is make life better. Definitely. In the long it's term. It's medical research, of yes. course. Of yes. Course. Which sometimes we sort of forget that these things, that there are people trying to work to make it better. But we're all going to age in the long term. I guess it's just to prolong um, cognitive skills as long as possible. And that's true. To enjoy life as much true. as possible. Yeah. If we know, again, if we know specific pathways of specific cognitive function, for example, processing speed is getting uh, worse over time. Obviously, a 20 year old has better processing mm. speed, which uh, is underlying uh, thing for all cognitive functions. So if we can pinpoint, okay, that's a specific pathway that is responsible for, for processing speed, probably we can find some solution, some I don't know, drugs, some something chemicals, exists, some anything, yes. something yeah. that exists or develop new ones to boost processing speed, so prolong our cognitive functioning. Do you think we'll reach a time with, with the research with people like yourself where most of the diseases that we've known and conditions that we've known will disappear? Because when you think the advances in medical science so far have been so huge, really, from even 100 years ago, Absolutely. Hopefully that would be the case. The thing, well, the <laughs> things you're building now may not come to fruition immediately, but no. within 20 years could just be a normal thing. Let's hope. So that's your purpose. <laughs> Let's hope. To answer the question I asked you a while ago, I guess that's what you're really yes. working to achieve, yes. isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. so much. I'm so pleased we could share this time together. We've talked about Thank it you, before Malcolm. and it's actually happened. Yes. <laughs> so our skills have come together. Thank you, Lilian. And Thank really you. the best wishes for the future, but not just for you, for the human race, for what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on our time. So until next time, keep yourself nice till then.